Hi folks, this is Anthony with uh, Tank Car Angler. Just wanted to do a little uh, preface to this uh, latest podcast. Today I'm going to be talking with Jonathan Antunes again. Um, I posted a, a podcast and video with him uh, at the beginning of May this year and um, on the topic of fishing wet flies with a tank car rod. And um, this is sort of a follow-up to that. Um, I've had the opportunity to fish that way for a while now, and um, I'm really enjoying it. And I, I think it's um, quite different than um, the way people are used to fishing wet flies, much more surface-oriented, active method. And um, it's just really cool. It's really fun. So I just wanted to follow up with Jonathan and um, cover some stuff that we hadn't covered to get into a little bit more detail on some things. Um, as always, if you have not subscribed, please subscribe uh, to the podcast or to the YouTube channel. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, click like and um, the notification bell. Uh, we appreciate that. And um, enjoy. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. To kind of get started, I think the, the thing we touched on briefly in our discussion, but we didn't get into a lot of detail, was... Um, uh, there are two things that really stood out to me. We, we you kind of mentioned Cutcliffe briefly and Cutcliffe flies, but we don't get into that very deeply. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned that I that I noticed, and it's pretty key to the way that you're fishing these flies and the way that I was fishing them. You say you like to tap tap, you know. And um, I know in our first discussion we talked about that a little more. Um, and this and the the one that actually got published, we we touch on it, but um, not in a whole lot of detail. So I kind of wanted to. To get into that, and I wanted to ask you, um, with that more sort of active style, um, did you come into that through, uh, was that a Tankara thing like Pon Pon or, uh, and or from reading these old English texts about old fixed line fishing? I'm kind of curious where that comes from for you. Right. <clears throat> well, uh, in the... In the in the early stages of this thing, I was fishing uh, the South Platte, and I, I've talked about this. I've written about this several times about uh, this, you know, this day that I had there. That was really difficult. Um, it was, I think, maybe three years ago now. Uh, it was the day that we had this like huge wind from. It's called a derecho, which is like a just a blast of wind, you know, but the whole day was just blustery. I mean, it was 20, 25, 30, you know, 30 mile per hour winds. And it's like, you know, we had made the trap, you know, the trek to get out there. And we're like, got to make, make the most of what we got. Um, you know, I had, I had my, um, my thing car rod, my, um, Oni Honryu, uh, 395 with me. And, <clears throat> Just the set of circumstances that kind of led to it was, uh, one, I forgot my tippet. I forgot my 5X tippet. And I kept popping off fish on the 6X. So I was like, oh, man, I, I, the, only, the only other one I have is four. Uh, but these fish, you know, when it's low and clear like it was, um, and it's springtime, and I was like, man, what am I going to do? You know, I only have this 4X. It's going to turn out to be a miserable day. Uh, and then I, I started to kind of piece something together in my head and it was mostly from watching, uh, what was happening on screen. So the wind was blowing, of course, not in the right direction. Uh, it was coming from, uh, from up, from upstream down and <clears throat> as it often does there. And I'm like, okay, uh, what, how am I going to do this? because I can't even cast, like I can't even cast a level line. Um, this is a real challenge. Uh, so I started to see some caddis and there was a lot that it started to be like a really heavy caddis hatch. It was a caddis hatch. And also like I saw them jumping up and down on the water, but also maybe, maybe ovipositing, maybe, I don't know what, the, you know, who knows what it, what runs through a caddis's head. Um, but you know, just, kind of popping in and out of the water, maybe even hatching too. So I was like, I could work with this. Um, so I tied on a Futsu Kebari, um, which for those who 
don't know what that is, it's a fix. It's a stiff, uh, stiff hackled uh, uh, Tenkara fly. So instead of soft hackled, stiff hackled, it's just kind of tied in almost like a dry fly, but without a tail. <clears throat> and I, I lengthened my line out, and I just started kind of line sailing. Really, I mean, at that point, I you know you could, every once in a while in a lull you could get a cast in. But most of the time, it was just, you know, the, the fly would pop in and out, in and out of the water. And um, and every once in a while, I was allowed to kind of, you know, kind of drag, drag it around the top. But it was, I had already had experience with tap tap um, from fishing smaller streams. I just, I had no clue that it was actually going to work on a place like that. Um, so you go into you go into the fly shop. You go into the fly shop. There, they're going to tell you, oh, you need to, you know, these little tiny nymphs, and you know, got to put three on there and a thing of a bobber or whatever. And <clears throat> yeah, I didn't want to do any of that stuff. So I was like, okay, well, maybe this works, maybe it doesn't. I got to give it a shot, right? And it worked, and it continued to work. <laughs> and I ended up catching one of the nicest rainbows that I'd ever caught out of there uh, at the time. And I was like, and I mean, these fish were coming. They were they were breaching the water, trying to grab this fly, <clears throat> and it was a lot of fun. I was like, well, this is interesting. I kept it in the back of my head, and then later on, about maybe I don't know, a couple months later, I think it was in December, I uh, purchased uh, Paul Gaskell's book on the cut cliffs, you know, and mostly because. I was really interested in the history of it and it's it's kind of like Brit britain's stiff tackle kutsu you know what i mean um obviously tied in a in a different manner but uh very similar in its in its presentation of being a, a more of an active presentation <clears throat> so i remember tying up a few and heading back to the heading back to the river and just having you know lights out kind of fishing just unbelievable you know this was already in like summer you know in the summertime it was it was red hot i mean anything you put on the water anything you were twitching on the water would just get slammed you know um <clears throat> yellow seemed to be a great color for that place but yeah it was just uh it was just one of those things you know it just kind of a couple ideas from here and there you know and then this kind of coalesced and i I just started to kind of do the two fly thing, you know. At at first, I was just doing one fly, and then I was just doing the two fly thing. I was like, "Man, this is interesting. Like, this has a totally different dynamic to how these flies are being presented." And yeah, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, yeah, that's kind of how it started. Yeah. So, um, so I know uh, we were talking earlier before we sort of started recording. You were tying up a, a rig, to show people. And mm -hmm. maybe it's a good time to show people how you, um, when you're doing the, the two flies, um, yeah. how you're rigging it up. Yeah. So <clears throat> basically, this uh, this it would be the one going to your main line, so the top of the screen. This is your your fly on the dropper, and the fly on the dropper. If the hook is pointing, uh, if the hook is pointing away, then you've tied it on correctly, right? If you can see that the hook is pointing this this way, right? Now, why is that important? Because when it goes down, it stays away from the main line. It doesn't get tangled as much, right? This little connection here is really, really simple. Start with a triple surgeon's knot. And the reason I do a triple surgeon's is because I I I can't I can't afford to do a double. It slips too often on a fixed line rod, especially with big fish. So triple surgeon knot holds a little bit better, but do your triple surgeon knot and keep that tag end that heads toward the back a little bit longer. And then you end up with a tag that you can put on, uh, keep it around six or less, six inches or less, right? And then tie your fly to it. Right? Now, once you've done and you've tied a couple of them on or whatever, you know, you lose one, whatever. Now you have a knot that you can use and then you can put on a dropper a different way um later on but this is this is the way i would start because it's a little bit easier right so about 
I'm making this short because I I I can't fit it into the screen. So this this is about I don't know seven inches away from the other one, right? But really, what you want is about maybe a foot and a half or more, right? So that way, when it tilts back, it's not it's not directly touching the other one, and they're kind of you know one is in the surface, one fly is in the surface, and the other fly is just kind of dangling. And you have that angle because you have a really long rod and a light line. So you can keep most of that line off the water, right? And now this fly is just kind of swimming along and you're tapping and this thing is just bouncing in the surface and going crazy, you know? And I've seen, I've seen some amazing things. Like I've seen fish just leap, you know, leap out of the water. I'm setting the hook like as they come back down you know um it's it's exciting to watch really uh and it's it's a fun way to fish not efficient i, I never want to sell this as something like oh you're going to catch so many fish no this isn't what this is about this is about fun this is about watching them do some really fun things and catching fish in a really interesting way you know i'd say even more fun than a dry fly yeah yeah um I would I would tend to agree with you after spending some time doing this. Um, uh, before I, it. I do want to discuss a little bit about about how I've I've been doing it, which is a little different than you've been doing it, and I and I'll explain why, kind of what what my uh, sort of problem was that I was solving. But um, mm -hmm. before that, um, so sure. so I know, and when I listened back to our other discussion, yeah, it was a little unclear to me. Um, how the flies were were acting so the the top fly is generally bouncing on the surface above the you know it's above kind of bouncing on the surface and your mm -hmm. your, your point fly or the, the lower fly is um still pretty shallow though right this is near you know under the surface and when you're when you're tapping just to be totally explicit with everything i don't have a rod handy but um you're kind of tapping like this is that what you're doing mm -hmm. yep and it's it's rhythmic you want to keep you want to keep a rhythm to it and you kind of have to figure out what that rhythm is um sometimes the fish would rather have that fly just kind of stuck in the surface so you kind of have to play around with you know what's happening there because you know if you if you pull too much it pulls the fly right out of the water and sometimes they just kind of like it doing this thing in the surface here and that's uh, or even dragging like like straight up dragging in the surface you know um seems to make a huge difference in you know and how they react to it and you're doing this um when you're doing this you're mostly downstream like a cross stream yep. downstream yep cross stream just swinging it through the entire run just kind of dancing it across um usually at around a 30 degree so from me 30 degrees out and then kind of do the do the do the little you know the the manipulation until you get to straight out and then even then you know just kind of slowly bring it up until you get to the back cast because it's i mean they'll hit it they'll hit it then too you know so to, to backtrack just a little bit um so the cut cliff flies that um that you're that you're talking about how were you um how did you come across that style of fly uh it's mostly through uh adam rieger um adam rieger is uh I call him cutcliffe east because he he loves the style he loves the flies and he was kind of the one that got paul into it and i think it was more of the tenkara thing because you know we were as i was reading the book i was like this is some you know this book this this setup that he has it's funny because he doesn't really talk too much about a reel. When he says, when he says, you know, when he thinks about like all of the, you know, the battles that he's had with rod and line, the reel is kind of like a, whatever. It's a place, it's a storage, you know. He's got, you know, 12, he says 12 foot is, you know, an acceptable length and 13 is, you know, 13 is his, you know, anywhere from 13 to, 13 to 11 um is kind of where he was in the length of the run so that's i mean that's tenkara territory um 
I think it's a lot easier to do with a stick car rod, to be quite honest. I don't know. I've never I never cast a green heart rod, and I'm sure that it's it's miserable. <laughs> sure it is. Yeah. I mean it's gotta weigh a ton, right? Yeah, yeah. Um but see, I'm not the only person that ever talks about that that's talking about long rods. Um there is a guy by the name of Wright. Uh Leonard Wright, Wright I believe. Lloyd Wright, yeah. Leonard and Lloyd. Wright. Lloyd was, uh, he was always talking about the long run. And, you know, he was, you know, he was stuck using, you know, maybe a 10 foot rod. Um, but I think, I think he would have enjoyed this because, I mean, this is a totally different way of, of fishing, you know. Um, and I think he would have, he would have liked some of the things that you could get away with with this presentation. But, I mean, sometimes when you hear when you hear him talking about, or when you read him talking about these kinds of things, it's you can see it very easily. And you know, if you're you have experience with a long rod and light line, it it makes perfect sense. You know, and that's why that's why Cutcliffe, I think, is a little bit overlooked. I think, as in terms of a of a writer, uh, in terms of a uh, of an angler, some of the things he talks about is just if you don't if you don't approach it from a fixed line perspective um you really it, it's kind of hard to grasp right like what he's doing and you know well, what do you mean you're moving the fly and what do you mean you have to work the fly you know what it, it, that's because that's all the instruction he ever gives you is to work the fly um so he kind of basically says well you figure it out on your own you know i'm not gonna tell you how to work the fly um yeah, and that's the the book is um, I I downloaded it years ago from uh, archive.org. You can I'm pretty sure you can get it on there. And it's is it uh, rapid f trout fishing and rapid streams? Is that the the name of the book? Exactly. I don't remember what it is exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's um, the art of trout fishing and rapid streams. Yeah. No, and I remember like in in looking at that book, it didn't I didn't get real deeply into it, and it kind of only went back and looked at it after. Yeah, Adam and uh, started talking about it and you and and Paul um, it's a tougher book I think it's kind of a tougher book to read like I read some of those older books that engaged me a lot more and that one's kind of like um, and you kind of got to stick with it I think you know what I mean it's yeah um, yeah it's kind of like that uh, he's he's kind of a hackled nerd um, he talks a lot about birds and and hackles and he wasn't a fan of wings wing flies he kind of didn't like them he added a few in his book just you know to make people happy <laughs> uh, but he really didn't care for them at all um he thought they were not necessary i happen to agree um although they do look nice they just uh they don't make it doesn't make a lick of difference to the fish that's for sure um unless it's like a bright color or something and that's the point of it you know but yeah, he's uh, it's it's really kind of an interesting uh, thing to read through because he's 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 he, I don't think he's really trying to sell anything, and that's 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 what makes him kind of like you know this this guy's like doing something completely different, totally out of step with what was going on in the eighteen hundreds, right? Completely out of step, just. Oh, I'm just still doing this thing, you know. <laughs> still doing this thing from the last century. No problem, you know. Um, so yeah, it's he's kind of a he's kind of an oddball, and I, that's that's what attracted me to him is uh, that he 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 wanted to do something different, or he wanted to just talk about what he was doing, and he, he really wasn't trying to sell anything. Yeah, yeah. So we talked a little before about um, the Paul Gaskell's book uh, that you have. Um, and what's the name of that book? Uh, the name of the book is uh, Fly Fishing Master H.C. Cutcliffe Rediscovered in the Art of Trout Fishing and Rapid Streams. Yeah. So um, if people haven't haven't seen, I don't have that book. Or I haven't. I think I you do. can. I think you can get a um, yeah. Kindle version of it too. Yeah. Um, and um, I've watched there. They, there are videos you can watch on YouTube where they're talking mm -hmm. about about the stuff that about the flies that are featured in that book and they're they're showing the flies and they're going to get the uh the special 
fur from the cow and stuff. And that's, there's videos about that. So you should, if you haven't seen those, I'll put some links to all that if uh, down below and into the book. Um, yeah, the, so it, it's really, I'm experimenting with, with the modern version of, of fix line, which is brought to us by Japanese anglers. Um, what they've managed to, to come up with, with carbon fiber and all that. Um, but I'm visiting something that happened in the 1800s, right. trying to recreate that a little bit on my own stream and finding out that, holy crap, this is really effective. Um, and on a very pressured piece of water. Yeah. Um, like you wouldn't expect this kind of, of thing. And I, I think a lot of people kind of, when they do ask me about it, they're like, and that works. I was like, let's just stick around for a minute, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So this is where, so, so I'll tell you what my experience has been then after our, our first discussion. So mm. when, I, when I had the first kind of discussion with you, I mean, I've, um, I have my own sort of wet fly, um, you know, uh, light bulb moment in the driftless like a few years ago, but that was swinging wet flies. And so in our first discussion, that's discussion, that's kind of still what I had in my mind was that, that style of fishing, which is, is kind of a lot easier to do with rod and reel. You can kind of, you can swing wet flies downstream. There are certain, there are a lot of advantages to a 10 car rod. And we kind of touched on that with the, with the sort of the direct connection. When you go to set a hook, you you don't have, you know, 30 feet of heavy line that you're fighting against. But, um, but generally that's how I thought about it, you know, so I loved fishing wet flies in that way, but I was generally swinging wet flies under the surface and, uh, that's how I was doing it. Um, but since our discussion, so, uh, in the month of May, I pretty much, uh, took residence up in the state college area and, um, fished the pressured streams in central Pennsylvania. And during probably the most highly pressured month of the year may is it's that's when that's when those streams get the most pretty much the most pressure because there's a lot of hatch activity um yep. so so i didn't you know kind of jump right in thinking that's how i'm gonna fish right so so it, it's like with anything kind of like your story it kind of happened um accidentally so i was fishing in a in a special regulations area where you're not allowed to wade i got to fish from shore and, um, you know, so you kind of, you know, forced your limited, you can't get into position and cast everywhere you want to cast. So I was fishing a sulfur dry fly and, uh, and, a, and a dropper, uh, like a nymph. And I would cast out and then, you know, kind of try to manipulate the fly into these little behind rocks and into pocket water and stuff like that, right? And yeah. fish. So as I'm move, popping the fly up to move it, a fish hits it. And so, you know, like you do it again and you get another fish. So I started doing it on purpose. You know, I started popping that, that dry fly up and down on the surface and with a, uh, with a weighted, with a beat, like a beat head nymph underneath of it. Um, so the way I rig it is I have the dry fly and I tie the, the nymph above the dry fly with a, like a Davy knot and cinch it down just cause that's, that's an easy way to do it for me. Um, instead of going through the eye or whatever. So the, sure. Dry fly is essentially in line, you know, so there's not on a dropper like you were showing. Um, but with that style of rigging, I'm able to, uh, uh, in front of me, off to the side, I can pop the dry fly straight up and down at a distance because you've got the weight of that fly under the surface. So the fly, I can kind of keep it in one place even and pop that thing up and down. Um, right. And I started catching, catching fish on it. Um, so then I started doing it on purpose and before the hatch started catching fish you know during the hatch was catching fish um and like you say it's not really a numbers game necessarily like could i go in and nymph and catch a lot more maybe you know probably but but uh again like you say and and until you see it you don't believe it fish are leaving the water i mean there are large fish jumping out of the water you're hooking fish i i mean i think a few times they hit the fly when it was in the air i really yeah. think they did um, yeah. so, so it was, it was very eye opening. It was super fun. And the other thing about it is, um, uh, you know, I had, I was lucky enough to be able to fish a lot. So, you know, I didn't have to worry about like driving three hours to fish and drive, you know what I mean? So I had the, the luxury yeah. of, Hey, if I don't catch fish, no big deal. I can go later today or whatever. Um, but I, I was catching a lot more fish on highly pressured water 
in a highly pressured time of the year. And, and like you say, I mentioned it in the fly shop and kind of, you know, I, I don't know if they don't believe me or I don't know, but they kind of get a raised eyebrow when you talk about it. When I talked about wet flies, it wasn't so much. When I started talking about fishing them actively, then that's when it, it seemed like I lost, I lost the guy a little bit. Um, but so I started doing with a dry fly with a nymph and that worked really well. So it's a, it's sort of a, a twist on what you're doing, but if you're already rigged up for a dry dropper, um, this is a, just another kind of trick you can add. Um, and you can right. do it because of the way that that nymph anchors, you can do it at a pretty good distance and keep your fly and it doesn't even move that much. You know what I mean? You can kind of cast into that dead water. And, and, and I was fishing some larger, well, I can see this, this, like what's behind me there. It's hard to yep. tell scale, but it's fairly large. Like you couldn't wade across that section easily. It gets pretty deep. Um, and mm -hmm. I could fish across that fast current onto the far side and hit those, those dead spots where I, where I would see fish rising in pretty consistently. If I saw fish rising and I did this, even if the fly was pretty far from what you would think they were eating, I would get takers, you know, um, yep. it didn't have to be. Uh, generally a great match so so then you know i did that and then i thought well i'll just i'll go more legit and i'll do two wet flies um so i had some cut cliff style flies and they were fairly small these were probably tied on like a i mean hook sizes these days are hard to they're all over the place but 14 yep. you know like let's say a real 14 not some of these ones that are real big like a smallish 14. um sure. so i tied those in like a light color um, I tied some like sulfur colored and, um, and some like a rusty color and then um, and was using those with pretty good success during the, the sulfur hatch. And later in the month um, or on days where it was rainier and cloudier would get. Now, I don't want to they, they probably weren't blueing olives or play blue quills or something, but tiny little grayish mayflies are coming off what you would think were maybe blueing olives. But who knows what they really were, uh, but they were small probably 22s 20 like really small little guys um so i tied some smaller flies up for those um and and I, I was trying to fish a couple of them and i wasn't having great luck because i couldn't see them so i couldn't tell what my flies were doing right right um, so so what i and i did want to ask you about this too if you have sort of a go-to so what i ended up doing was um i there were some flies that at a distance appeared rusty colored, some kind of caddis. So I tied a cut cliff in a sort of rusty color and then the yep. tiny, like a tiny blueing all of behind it. So I could see the, at a distance, I could see what that was doing. And yes. then, you know, the blueing alls behind it doing something similar, you know? So that's kind of the yep. solution I came up with. And um, and often enough that hit, that hit either fly, that hit the bigger one, that hit the small one. Um, yep. And as long as there seemed to be surface activity, I went out a couple times when there was like no surface activity at all, and it was it was hard fishing. And in the evening, some fish started rising again, and they they got you know. So generally, yeah. if I saw activity, I could get some fish um, to hit. Um, so it was it was very eye opening, and uh, and I, I I tended to fish like the places I was fishing um, more like across stream into pockets and things like that rather than right. completely downstream because it was pretty fast water so I, when i would fish completely downstream it was it didn't seem to be super effective like i don't know if you can see that kind of stuff behind me and that real fast stuff I, you yeah. know so so i was kind of fishing more across stream and like you say you gotta um you you gotta pay attention um and i would see um often you would you would see a fish that would react but wouldn't wouldn't hit and then you're like, okay, when well, you got to try to figure out like, so often what I could do, and I don't know if it's what you were talking about before, but with like a hesitation. So I would see that and I would stop, you know, I'd be bouncing it or something and I'd see this fish and I would kind of stop sometimes. And then he would take the fly, you know, you didn't, you never know for sure, but it seemed like something a little bit different would trigger them. So, but yeah, it was super fun and very effective. Like, uh, I mean, and everyone probably has that, the number of fish, right. That keeps them is is interesting enough right you know uh, and it certainly for me would do that because you catch a couple like that and it, and i don't even care if i miss them if i miss 70 yeah. percent, you know because yeah like, that's 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 the thing that i realized like uh when i started having some of those days like that where i wasn't catching as many but i caught maybe two or three that way 
And I was like, oh yeah, that's that's enough. That's an I and especially if it was a cool, you know, it was a really cool take, you know. Um it's I think it's more about like the quality of of the time that you're spending out there and and like how many memories can I make? You know, how many memories can I store up? And I think Cuckliff Cuckliff says it really well in his book when he's talking about and he's reminiscing, he's you know, he's opening up all the, you know, the 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 materials and you know he smells the spices and he's thinking of like oh the fish that i you know the fish that i've caught and the things that have happened you know and i'm like i know exactly where he's going because that's that's exactly what i do during the winter like i i think about like these really cool fish captures that you know that happen throughout the year and i they it's it's more it's more it means more to me those memories mean more to me than if I had, you know, several days of catching 50 or a hundred fish. The value, yeah. is, the value is higher. You know, I, I can remember, I, I, I saw it happen, you know? Right. Cool. And, it, and it is like, it is like, um, it is magic in a way that, um, and, and I think part of it too, uh, at least for me is like, you're out there and you're doing this thing that you, that like no one else is doing which is kind of cool too. You feel like you're yeah. out there doing this and, and like you're yeah. probably the only one fishing that way that day, right? Yeah. You know, fishing in this active style and bringing fish up. It's, and it, it's um, kind of, yeah, adds that extra layer. So, I mean, it's certainly not something that like, you know, in the middle of the winter, I, I can't expect it's going to be super effective, but I mean, who knows? Yeah. But, um, yeah. but when it's, when it's going to work, um, it's certainly worth it, and maybe it's it's maybe it's old news to a lot of ten car anglers uh, that are fishing that way anyway. I don't know, but um, but it's certainly worth um, spending some time doing for sure. And I want to thank you for kind of uh, reminding me of that. Um, you you know not to be static. You know what I mean to like mm -hmm. be um, just open to new ideas and new ways of of doing things. Um, but it is a skill. And like, like you point out in, in the last one, you talked about how um, it is kind of hard to write about it and, and to, to teach someone about it because you got to do it. And, and that's so true because until you do it, like, um, uh, and I still have the, the trouble sometimes, and maybe you've had this, like you, 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 you catch a fish and you're like, well, what did I just do? Like, what was it that I did that, that caught that fish, you know? Um, right because you maybe you can't get another one right away or you're like you know you did something right but what was it you know and you got to pay attention so it's a it's a mindful focused kind of way if to be successful i mean you can get out there too and kind of just do it and not really sure you know, have to focus you so hard you know but, yeah. but i think there's a lot of benefit and you talked about that last time a lot about um about paying attention you know to what you're doing yeah this uh tells there's a, a fly uh, from Japan, um, and I'm completely blanking on on what what prefecture it's from or anything like that. But if you look at this fly, it's tied with um, bantam rooster, and the hackles are out like this, and the body is made of shrew, of water shrew, right? Japanese water shrew. And if you read the caption, this is in my best dreams. Uh, Fujioka um, brought this fly to my attention. It says it says on the surface, Chung Chung the fly. Yeah. And I'm like, what in the world does that mean? So I I asked Fujioka. Uh, I sent him an email. I was like, hey, you know, what does this mean? What is Chung Chung the water? You know. And he's like, oh yeah, no, you basically dragging it on top of the water. You're <laughs> You know, and I says it like tap tap, and he's like, yeah, yeah, very much so. You're actively moving it on top of the water. You know, I just never seen that word before. Not yeah, never even heard of that expression. Yeah, um, but it was. I mean, the fly looks exactly like a cut cliff. I mean, you know, it's it's nothing new, really. Um, I found out just recently that uh, there were some anglers in the Morioka prefer, uh, prefecture who are using more than one fly. Just fascinating to me. Uh, I'd never, I, 
didn't realize that anyone was doing that or that there was a history of it. But yeah, um, they were using several different, you know, several flies. Um, their rigs became a little bit more complicated. And, you know, they were they were just having, you know, they were just experimenting with it. But I mean, apparently it worked. So <clears throat> I don't know. That's there's nothing new to this. This is I mean, dapping and dip and and dibbing and and all of this stuff is as old as dirt, you know. Yeah, yeah. We don't know who invented it first. It's just, you know, it's always been around. I'm I'm pretty sure that's kind of how these anglers in uh in the Macedonia were doing it in 2 AD. You know, they're just kind of moving that fly right at the surface to see if they can get a fish to attack it. Uh, one one of the one of the aspects I wanted to talk about was uh like I discovered that, you know, fishing two flies at the same time um it does something because I, I've so I tried this. This was last Sunday. I was fishing uh, on the South Platte, and I had two um, two flies on that were exactly the same. They were um, there's a there's a fly called a fibber, and it looks like a looks like a caddis, looks like a caddis pupa. <clears throat> I had two of those on, and I kept catching fish on that top, you know, top one, top, always the top one. And, and, you know, I, I don't know what happened. I think, I think I may have got caught in a tree somewhere and I, you know, I had to pull it out. It's gone. Right. So like, okay, well, let me just put one, you know, let me put one, but keep it really short. Keep the tip it really short. No, they didn't want that. Mm -hmm. so I was like, all right, well, fine. I'll spend a couple minutes here and retie this whole thing and put it back together. And sure enough, as soon as I start doing it again, it's that top line. And it doesn't. Uh, it's just. It's just a very small difference in that angle. So, so here's something interesting. Cutcliffe calls the back fly a stretcher, right? And I was thinking about that, and I was like, you know, I kind of glossed over that word a million times, you know. And I was like, no, this is exactly what it does. A stretcher fly. It basically stretches that whole thing out so that that fly can dance freely, you know. That's. Right. That's why it would be called a stretcher. I can't think of any other reason yeah. why it'd be called a stretcher. But there's there's times too where you talk about that uh, the the uh, blue winged olive when you're or you're some small fly. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes what I'll do is I'll put two wet flies of slightly different make. You know, one maybe one shiny, one not shiny. I don't know, whatever. Um, but or maybe just two of the same, right? And all I'm really looking for is the commotion you know i just just a, a a boil or something like that and then you know i just set the hook um you know uh venables was i think one of the ones that guys that he was like my eyes aren't my eyes aren't that great so i just i just kind of watch the area where i think my flies are <laughs> if i see a boil of any kind i'd set the hook you know yeah, I've I, I've been taking your advice too. In the first one, you talked about that. Yeah, watching where, looking where you think the flies ought to be, you know, kind of rather than focusing on, you know, in and so I've been trying to do that. It's hard to to do, you know, because you, you just want to look at what you can see more easily. But yeah. like I said before, I was surprised. Often I'll see that I'm moving fish, you know, and if you're not looking for that, you know, um, mm -hmm. you're gonna miss those fish, you know. You move them, yeah. at least you know they're there. But yeah, I've, so have you have you gotten into the habit of letting it like letting them take and then setting the hook yeah that's what yeah that's so tough. so i i have um it's hard to do but again you you mentioned that so i've i've kind of watched that and when i especially like um obviously if, if i don't see the sometimes you, you, i hook often i hook a fish it's at a distance i don't see it coming so it's kind of but but in the case that i do see the fish often i will kind of like Say I'm I'm moving it fairly actively, and I and I'll see a fish. I'll kind of let my arm drift downstream a little bit, right. and um, yeah, and then you'll you know then I'll get those those fish will kind of take. So I've certainly noticed that. Um, um, it's still hard not to have the trigger finger, you know. Like, <laughs> well, so it's like I think I may have mentioned this in the last one, but you know, it's like popper fishing with for bass. You know, um, what I used to do. Is especially when I was walking the dog or Zara Spook or something like that, is I would kind of keep it in the corner of my eye. And I wasn't really watching it. And then I was telling myself, don't set until you feel it. 
don't set until you feel the pressure right so that and i had to keep repeating that to myself because otherwise i would just rip it out of their mouth you know um you know bass will grab it flip it around in their mouth swallow it and that that tug they'll, they'll keep it for a while and not like trout yeah. um trout spit things pretty quick but um i think you can count to two and you'll be all right but um well i guess we're we're getting on an hour here um so I, I i appreciate you coming on jonathan and is there i don't i don't want to cut you off there's anything else that that you've got um you've kind of observed that you want to talk about um but uh, i think we've at least for me anyway cleared up some some questions i had and, and i was able to share a little bit hopefully i made sense to, to about what i was talking about um sure. just sort of a different way of doing it um and even when i was fishing the two the two wet flies i was still tying them um kind of with the top one would be just in line basically yeah. um, and then rather than letting it dangle because so so my problem is i've got like um i'm older than you and and uh i've got like tendon problems in both my hands sure. and, and tapping like that is not like that's not great so so what what i've been doing is i've just been doing the whole you know i've been moving the rod because the yep. just so i've been kind of moving the rod or just wiggling the tip you, know, you can kind of get that wiggle going yeah, kind of do this yeah and doing it like that instead uh instead of tapping just because it's it's just a little harder for me it hurts my finger um yep so the spanish have kind of uh modified their their fly fishing um as, i guess as the rods got shorter because the french the french do it too uh the french have you know they used to have like 20 foot rods right they used to have the horsehair line they used to have these droppers you know several flats right and the way they would cast, you know, they just cast it out and then they would just kind of, you know, they'd be moving the rod basically with two hands. So it's a lot easier to do, you know. And I, I would imagine some of them were even like tap the bottom, you know, tap the bottom handle just to get it kind of, you know, moving. Or they would just kind of, you know, move it across the water and get, you know, get fish to strike. So they had a lot of reach, they had a little length, they had, all of that was hanging, you know, it was nice. Um, <clears throat> but what the Spanish do now is they have bubbles. Mm -hmm and they use spinning rods and they use a long you know 11 foot 10 foot rod uh spinning rod and they're casting it out and they still have their little team of wet flies you know but the bubbles at the end the bubble causes the resistance the stretcher you know yeah yeah the bubble becomes the stretcher and now you can actually kind of hold that in place as you're you know as you're going along um we talk about wet flies in the context of the western gear yeah and that does not allow for any of this yeah. um it's when you move it's when you move out of the realm of the short rod heavy line that you can start to kind of mess around with this other stuff and i'm not surprised that the guys at that fly shop couldn't understand what you were talking about you know or didn't even grasp what you were talking about um because it's it's not within their physics you know? right yeah, yeah. He said he's yeah. like a nine. What do you mean the lines on top of the water? What do you mean you're not putting any line on the water? What is that? How does that work? You know? Yeah, yeah. He even said he's like a nine foot five weight guy or whatever. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's not gonna really do it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and some. So here's the thing. There's there's a that style that you're talking about with the bead. Um, <clears throat> they call it uh, dancing canis right and that's it's just diving it's just diving uh nobody's reinventing anything it's yeah. just the, you're casting with the euro nymphing rod so you have to have weight right a little bit at least right yeah so you can get it out there um but i mean it's the same principle you're, you're doing exactly the same thing yeah. um now if they made if they made some euro nymphing rods or or were long rods that were more flexible and able to cast a level line. I just want to thank you again for coming on and chatting with me again. Um, no I, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, say thanks for kind of bringing this, you know, out, you know, uh, to the people. And I, and I hope like <laughs> our last podcast and this one, you know, like I, you know, hope that people start thinking about it. Um, and it is, it is not exactly, um, I mean, I know Tenkar is an active fishing style, but I think this is different than what a lot of people think of, you know? Yeah. 
um, yeah. kind of being more, more, much more surface oriented, you know? So um, mm-hmm. I'd love, I hope more people start doing it and we get some more community talking about it and, and everything. It'd be nice. You got to get that book written about it. <laughs> yeah. Seriously though, you could, you could probably do a, I mean, uh, bring it in the history and, and there's a, there's a little book in the making there. Yeah. I feel like I can get at least a few chapters in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You got to do it, but Hey, man, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate it. Oh, Thanks. Yep. Take it easy. No problem.